Examining Barack Obama's latest picks for his cabinet, what do the U.S. president's choices say about the direction of his second term in office? Also, in life he was a huge baseball fan, so why is the death of Hugo Chavez likely to be celebrated by the corporate owners of Major League Baseball in the U.S.? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansu. This week, U.S. Republican Rand Paul addressed the Senate for 13 hours, a mammoth attempt ostensibly to block the approval of President Barack Obama's pick to head the CIA. In the end, though, John Brennan was comfortably approved by the Senate, despite persistent concerns over the secrecy and conduct of the U.S. drone program that he has largely overseen. It's estimated to have killed thousands in countries like Pakistan and Yemen. Now, several other appointments will have to be considered by Congress. After weeks of speculation, this week Barack Obama named Gina McCarthy to lead the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and Ernest Moniz as the president's pick for the Department of Energy. Mary Jo White is his choice for the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is supposed to rein in the excesses of Wall Street. So what do these latest nominations say about President Obama's future policies? Joining me in the studio to discuss President Obama's cabinet appointments are Rick Piltz, the founder of Climate Science Watch, a former U.S. official in the government's climate science program under George W. Bush, and Ryan Grimm, the Washington bureau chief for the Huffington Post. Ryan Grimm, then, first of all, John Brennan easily confirmed, but at least as a result of Rand Paul's filibuster, are we now finally having a debate about the drone program? Well, usually by the time uh, we, we notice that we're having a debate, the debate in Washington is starting to fizzle out. So we're, we're probably at that phase, but at least we, we had a debate. That was it. In past, I think that, 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 that might be it. You're going to need something else uh, to, to trigger it uh, to come back into the news. Now, the administration is offering to provide some, uh, some more uh, memos that they've written to the, to the Senate. If, if those come out, that, that could lift it up again. Uh, but yes, it, unfortunately in Washington, you know, we churn through stuff so fast that two days is, is actually uh, an extended debate nowadays. <laughs> I should, we should be clear here about what Rand Paul was objecting yeah. to, though. It was, about, it was about drones in the U.S. And, and the potential for targeting U.S. civilians and surveillance, I suppose. It wasn't about Brennan's drone program as a whole on the kill list and not giving non-U.S. citizens due right. process. That, as far as everyone's concerned, is fine. Well, Paul, to, to his credit, he said, uh, he, he did raise that subject, and he said that's, a, that's, a, that's another story, that, that's, that's another debate to, to have. And he did uh, mention what are called, you know, signature drone right. strikes, which means that uh, you don't know who you're bombing, you just look down from the sky and you see Killing a group people of because people. they look like they're up to no good. Right. They, you say, hey, bad people live here and right. bad people live here. And look, these people are traveling from here to here, so right. therefore they must be bad and then killing them. And a lot of drone strikes are what are called signature strikes, which have but massive Did collateral. he object to those or was he simply saying he we're not going to have this here? He was raising them as, a, as an objection, but right. he said that's a debate for another time. So at least he called it a debate, which is, you know, right. uh, well, we'll is see. the first one in Washington that I know of to, to well, now, at least be saying that. Now that John, John Brennan is going to be the CIA director, we'll watch and see whether there is actually a debate right. finally about that. So let's move on then to these other appointments. Let's run through some of the other um, nominees, uh, specifically relating to the economy and the environment most recently, actually. Mary Jo White is the president's pick to hold banks accountable as the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission. She's been on the other side of the table for many years, defending banks like J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America as a million-dollar corporate lawyer. Her husband, in fact, currently counts three big banks among his clients and is making a great deal of money as a result. President Obama has tapped MIT professor Ernest Moniz as his secretary of energy. Uh, he concluded that hydraulic fracturing, known as fracking, is a, quote, bridge to a low-carbon future after he led a study, in fact, funded by oil and gas companies. So there's some controversy there. We'll look at that. Then there's Gina McCarthy, Obama's pick to lead the Environmental Protection Agency. She's the former director of the EPA's trusted deputy. McCarthy has made climate change a priority. She's been praised by those who work with her, especially on developing the EPA's mercury standards, which are estimated to prevent 11,000 premature deaths from poor air quality. So lots to talk about. Let's begin then with the economic picks. Mary Jo White, the question here has been which idiom to use. Is it uh, poacher turned gamekeeper or 
fox guarding the hen house? Right. We don't know yet. We'll see. She's a, she's a real wild card because, you know, Joseph Kennedy, terrific uh, head of the SEC and was one of the most corrupt bankers in Wall Street bef before then, in the 1920s. Uh, Gary Gensler is, you know, one of the toughest reformers in Washington, the head of the CFTC. He was a Goldman Sachs executive before he came. And progressive senators, Maria Cantwell, Bernie Sanders, put a hold on his nomination for that very reason. He, he turned around. He was borderline radicalized. So there's a, there's a chance, but as you said, a ton of her income has come from big banks. Her husband's income coming from big and banks. A ton of her income in the future will come from uh, the law firm through her retirement fund, though, which, I mean, that's going to be a major conflict of interest. Right. She, she, she owes a lot of her wealth uh, to, to big banks. Uh, you know, other people have broken out of that and been tough. She was tough in the past, but... This isn't how you would design it if you were trying to. But this idea of build a why pick someone regulatory. with such a conflict of interests for their entire retirement pension? You know, based on the fact that the big, big banks survive and prosper. I wish I could tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Jamie Dimon actually called uh, her the perfect choice. That's the CEO of okay. J.P. Morgan. I'm not sure. She, I don't know whether she was happy with that recommendation. Um, but there's another point, though, is that as a lawyer, she actively quashed SEC investigations. And you have to wonder, and, in, and allegedly actually got someone fired, some people allege, an investigator. You wonder how morale is at the SEC when they know that that's her background. Yes. The, the, what she was involved with in, this, in the case that you're referring to was one of the worst examples of, kind of regulatory capture and, and, and re, the revolving door the, that, that, that she was able to use her relationships with her, uh, you know, her past regulators to, to squash an investigation for the firm that she was working for. She, she helped somebody get a, a high-paying job going from regulator to, to a blue-chip firm. Yeah, it, it, it's ugly. All right. Well, we, we won't make any judgments yet, but that's <laughs> the background. Sylvia Matthews Burwell, actually, we didn't mention earlier, but that's another economic, uh, well, and everything sort of appointment, Office of Management and Budget. Perhaps you can explain who she, who she is and what the OMB does. Right. So she, she's a Clint, Clinton administration official who... Uh, you know, who most recently has, has been uh, working with Walmart's uh, philanthropic arm and also works with the Gates Foundation, so their philanthropic arm. So, so she knows how to handle big sums of money. We, we, we know that. OMB is it's the, kind of the gatekeeper for a lot of, uh, it's a lot of federal policy. They, and it, a lot, it's, what, it's what the director makes of it. You can have a powerful OMDB director or you can have a very weak one depending on uh, how, how well the person asserts themselves in, in the White House orbit. But if you're looking for progressive economics and a new direction in, uh, in, president's, in the president's economic policy with, with the, both those appointments, it's not that great, is it? I mean, these are all kind of cut from the same cloth. The Bankers, Robert Rubin, Erskine Bowles, actually, Sylvia Matthews Burwell, you know, this, uh, worked under who wants to, you know, slash the deficit by cutting social spending. Uh, um, I mean, the we're best, not going to look at reform at banks, right, basically. The, the best you can say is that swapping... Treasury Secretary Geithner for Jack Lew is is a move away from Wall Street, even though is <laughs> Lew was himself at, at Goldman Sachs. Right. But uh, this is the standard we now have. He was only there for a few years uh, and, and otherwise is known as a pretty strong progressive uh, liberal in, in Washington. That's, you know, these are the lower standards that we're grading Washington by. In that, in that sense, it's probably an improvement. But, but protect the system, not necessarily reform. It might be the continuation of... Maybe. Of, uh, okay. Well, it's interesting, we were talking about the Office of uh, Management and Budget, and that does then bring us to the environmental picks for President Obama, because the previous head of the Environmental Protection Agency, Rick, um, was in some ways stymied by the OMB, Lisa Jackson. Perhaps you can explain why we have a vacancy in the EPA in the first place. Well, Lisa Jackson was a strong and, and very progressive EPA administrator, I think one of the real bright lights of the first, of Obama's first term. And a, a, one of her signature efforts was to strengthen the clean air uh, program with a, a toughened rule on smog emissions, that was something the Bush administration had been very bad on. It was a science-based rule, a health-based rule, and she was told by the White House, including the White House Office of Management and Budget, I think, and the President's Chief of Staff, to take that rule down and hold it, at least until after the election, after the Chamber of Commerce and a lot of the leading corporate representatives met with the Office of Management and Budget and, and, and lobbied against this. So for political right. expediency, uh, this, uh, this rule was taken down. And so the question with EPA is, will it be allowed to do its job? But Gina McCarthy, I mean, so Lisa Jackson was much loved by environmentalists, at least for trying. But she stepped down. Some said actually in some ways because, because she felt that the Obama administration had been so ineffective on, 
on climate change. But if Gina McCarthy was her deputy, is there still room for hope for environmentalists? Well, Gina McCarthy ran the, the air office uh, at EPA, uh, which is responsible not only for air quality regulation, but now for regulating greenhouse gas emissions. It's a very important office. Um, I think that Gina M McCarthy, uh, she may not be as great as Lisa Jackson, but she, 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 is, she is ready to do environmental regulation. Um, I don't think that the business interests are quite as antagonistic toward her as they were toward Jackson. But really, the question is, will she be allowed to do her job? I think that the White House is slow walking uh, the regulation of greenhouse gases. We're now, it's going to be nine years past the Supreme Court decision that led to the endangerment finding. We're going to be three and a half years beyond the endangerment finding on greenhouse gases. So far... What was the endangerment finding? The, the finding by EPA pursuant to the law on the Supreme Court ruling that emissions of greenhouse gases threaten public health and welfare, and that's supposed to trigger Which gave the regulation. The right, exactly, under the Clean Air Act. And so far now, we're fifth, in the fifth year of the Obama administration, and they do have a rule on vehicle emissions, a proposed rule on future power plants that haven't been built yet, and no action whatsoever, as far as I can see, on existing power plants. Well, this is power the interesting plants. thing. There are two interesting things there. Actually. First of all, I mean, the EPA has become so important, Ryan, because Congress isn't going to do anything. So now we're looking to see whether something will happen through the EPA. Is that correct? It's, it's yeah. the planet's last shot, almost, yeah. it's residing in the EPA. But, I mean, and there are some who wonder, actually, whether President Obama will make some grand bargain, uh, allowing perhaps the Keystone Pipeline to go ahead, which is very controversial. But then in, in, in return, they perhaps saying, OK, well, maybe we'll have tighter emission standards for for power plants now. I mean, do you think that's, is that the sort of thing we're looking at? Or, you know, these are that, the things we're throwing around. That's an interesting and very plausible <laughs> hypothesis. I right. mean, the State Department has come out with an environmental impact statement on the proposed Keystone Tar Sands Pipeline that seems to lay a predicate for approving it. Uh, not only do they minimize its uh, incremental greenhouse gas emissions, but they essentially say the tar sands are going to be developed one way or the other. Yeah. If they have to it's ship them out deal. of there on rail cars, they will. So there's no point in making it. I mean, it's, it's just like almost inviting the president to, to go ahead and allow it and keep from antagonizing Canada, although he'll antagonize the climate movement, the environmental and, and movement. An important part of his political base. I mean, right? And I mean, maybe at the same time yeah. then say, well, but we are going to regulate this and this and this, including emissions let's, from, let's from coal-fired power plants. To Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz, because we are already running out of time, unfortunately. Who is he then? Well, he was an Undersecretary of Energy under the Clinton-Gore administration. He's been at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, running an energy research center. They did a study that came out strongly in favor of natural gas, uh, hydro fracking, strongly nuclear power. But he's actually a, a, a very good candidate for Obama's so-called all of the above energy strategy. Well, and before we get onto that, I mean, this, I mean, he's the one we often hear this term bridge to the low carbon future. I and mean, he, he kind of, it was in that report, which was funded by the hydraulic fracturing, I mean, those who, the oil and gas industry, basically. I mean, well, it's, 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 it's clear that the Obama administration is strongly in favor of developing natural gas through hydro fracking. I mean, they're working with industry. They're trying to put a good sort of environmental face on it. And, and, and doesn't it reduce carbon emissions? Incrementally, although there's even debate about that if you look at leaks and so forth. But natural gas is displacing coal right. for electric power production. That's an incremental reduction in greenhouse gases with ser serious environmental issues. But what is it a bridge to? Is it a bridge to renewable energy, or does it just hold off the renewable energy or transition. Resources, I suppose, and, is, is right, and one, one consequence of uh, the lo low cost of energy through natural gas could be that it could drive out wind power and solar power and other, other renewables. And actually, the, the bridge then winds up pushing the shore away. So yes, and then we're also then, where we're taking that coal out in the U.S., the coal industry is exporting that coal right. to Europe and elsewhere. Anyway. Right. So the emissions end up somewhere else. There, there is no strategy to deal with the climate change problem. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Do they get it? Do they understand the emergency? That, I mean, we had a report this week about the planet being at its hottest, at its hottest for 4,000 years. Is there any urgency, as far as you can tell? Is there, is there a strategy the, to phase out carbon The president's science advisor, John Holdren, says the president understands the nature of the climate change problem. The president says he understands it, 
and that we need to deal with it. But there is no strategy, there is no policy that's commensurate with the urgency of the problem. It's a, it's a heavy lift politically. It's, it's not something that you would do just for fun. It's only if you understand the prospect of global climatic disruption, its costs and impacts. If you're willing to talk to the public about that in a sustained way and mobilize and do the political heavy lifting, you might start to get somewhere, but that's not where we are right now. Ryan Grimm, I mean, after the, the speech that President Obama gave on his re-election, people were, I know liberals were beside themselves with this, this speech. It sounded like an energized president who was gonna be emboldened and progressive on the environment, on the economy and everything else. Do any of these appointments suggest that uh, those liberals were right to be so hopeful? The EPA appointment, I think, is 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 a good one, and and, and there and there and there is hope there because you know there there is a, a major major urgency that this this is something that has to be dealt with now. That's what the president said. He has someone in place that could do that because if if you don't do it soon, right. as climate change starts to create more and more disorder around the globe, you you kind of lose the the. Yeah, but the it didn't sound like Gina McCarthy was even as much of a fighter as Lisa Jackson was. I mean, so you wonder. Well, I think she'd be a good soldier for the Obama. White House, you know, if, if she's given the green light, go, 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 right, she will move. If it's like slow walk these regulations, you know, take another four years to get another rule out, then that's what we'll see. So, so I Ryan think Grimm? the high politics will drive it. Obama, progressive, second term, it's going to be amazing, fearless. Let's have hope. <laughs> uh, Ryan Grimm, thank you very much. Ryan Grimm, Washington Bureau Chief of the Huffington Post. Rick Pills, thank you as well. Hope for change. <laughs> Keep hope alive. Now, he may have been a staunch critic of U.S. policy, but when it came to America's favorite pastime, Hugo Chavez couldn't get enough. He loved baseball. In fact, he was a talented pitcher and is said to have dreamed in his youth of playing for the San Francisco Giants. If Chavez's life had taken a completely different path, he wouldn't have been alone. 58 Venezuelans were members of U.S. Major League Baseball teams last year, second only to the Dominican Republic. U.S. baseball teams have long seen the two countries as a cheap source of labor and talent. But critics complained that the system was exploitative, with young players not treated as well as their U.S. counterparts. And it was this system that Hugo Chavez challenged when he became president. He forced U.S. teams to follow Venezuelan labor regulations. As a result, Many simply moved their operations to countries without such protections. Joining me now to discuss Hugo Chavez's relationship with Major League Baseball is sports correspondent for The Nation magazine, Dave Zirin. His latest book is called Game Over, How Politics Has Turned the Sports World Upside Down. Uh, Dave, then, what was the system like before Hugo Chavez of trying to pick Venezuelan talent for the major leagues? Well, the system in Venezuela is very similar, almost identical to what the system was like in the Dominican Republic. And those are the two greatest pipelines of foreign born talent into Major League Baseball. The way it would operate would be a Major League Baseball team would set up what they call baseball academies. Uh, less charitable people would call them ba baseball youth sweatshops. And what they would um, encompass is signing kids as young as 15 or 16 years old for a couple of thousand dollars and they're effectively owned by these academies. They live in dormitories, they're there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and well over 90%, 97% don't even get minor league contracts when it's all said and done. They effectively become disposable and they're put out without any skills, any education, or been anything. They've been taken out of school, presumably. Yes, they've school. been taken out of school. And to they, get, be part they of got this. no education while they were in these academies. No, or the most minimal education, like how to conduct an interview in English, for example, so the most rudimentary English skills, but nothing that would translate into an actual job when it's all said and done. So, um, Hugo Chavez becomes president. How, how does he reform the system? Well, first of all, it's worth saying that Hugo Chavez, huge baseball fan. Uh, he, of course, rose to power through the armed forces of Venezuela. He only joined the army in the first place because he wanted to try out to be a left-handed pitcher uh, for the Venezuelan army baseball team. So, huge baseball fan. But one of the things that he said was, look, you're no longer going to have free reign and an unequal power relationship with Venezuela. So, when you set up these academies here, this is what we're going to demand. First of all, there has to be more of an educational component for these young people that you're going to pay for. And that's an important part of it. Second of all, we demand 
demand that whatever town you're set up in, that you hire locals, that you provide jobs for local people. You don't people, bring people in from the United States to work here. You hire people locally. And third, we are going to tax you. And we're also going to tax 10% of the bonuses that you eventually give the best prospects, which could translate, of course, into millions of dollars. Now, Major League Baseball flipped out when Hugo Chavez put this forward. And the results of it have been astonishing, frankly. Uh, what were the results? Oh, well, <laughs> what the results were that the number of academies in Venezuela have dropped from uh, 22, and there are 30 major league teams, to five. And yet, with the dropping of 20 from 22 to like they just shut down basically. And with the dropping from 22 to five, it hasn't meant less recruiting of Venezuelan baseball talent. Um, in fact, uh, nine players from Venezuela played in the World Series this last year, including the MVP, uh, Pablo Sandoval of the San Francisco Giants. And the, the star of the other team, the first Triple Crown winner in decades, Miguel Cabrera, also from Venezuela. But what they've done instead is they hire uh, locals known as buscones. They're like local scouts, and they're looking to scout kids as young as, I'm being serious, seven, eight, or nine years old. And when the Busconis see kids with, with talent, what they do is they whisk them off to the academies in the Dominican Republic, which is, of course, also limited opportunities for young children of the, from the Dominican Republic to find a place in the academies. It might, it might be worth actually going through the situation now in the Dominican Republic, uh, which didn't go through the reforms under, under Chavez. Major league teams, as with Venezuela, they're recruiting players uh, as young as 15, we, we say, but I guess, I guess certainly in Venezuela, then that, that's even, even And it's younger. much younger. Yeah. In, there, there's an informal right. system of scouting as well that goes much younger than that. Uh, and uh, as in the, uh, unlike in the U.S., the, the players don't have to finish school before teams can sign them. Players are brought to unregulated baseball academies in the Dominican Republic. In one academy, 19 teenage boys shared a single bathroom with no running water. A Mother Jones investigation revealed that 21 of the 30 major league teams operating in the Dominican Republic don't have certified athletic trainers and right. first aid supplies on hand, and players are paid substantially less than their U.S. counterparts. Uh, when more than uh, and when more than 97 percent of them don't make the team, that they're sent home without job mm -hmm. training, much as it was before them. And in, in, as in, in Venezuela. And may I say something else yeah. that wasn't in that article in Mother Jones, which is a terrific article, by the way. Uh, but one of the things that they didn't include, which is important, is that in the Dominican Republic, steroids, performance enhancing drugs, are legal and available over the counter. Now, they're also incredibly expensive. So what a lot of these young people do is they take animal steroids. They get them from vet veterinarian outlets, which led to the death of a, of a young teenager named Lino Ortiz. And, and there was another death, though, another 16-year-old player, Yuri Guyen, of course, which, which brought some attention to it. What, what happened to him? Oh, well, he, he died of uh, bacterial meningitis and the sort of thing that, if there had been a doctor on hand, could have very easily identified and get, gotten him treatment for. Yet without that treatment, uh, he died. And well, just because there was simply no, there's no medical help in one of these academies. Yeah, there was no medical like help, so there was nobody looking out for symptoms. Right. And there's nobody, which is so shocking given that it's an athletic academy, there's nobody looking out for the health and well-being of these kids. But there's no evidence that Venezuela is going to turn back the clock then and, turn, and, and go back to the sort of conditions of the Dominican Republic. Well, it's all up in the air. As, as your station has done a brilliant job of covering, uh, Venezuela is now in tremendous flux. We don't know what's going to come out of that, but certainly Major League Baseball owners have a sharp eye on this. And proof of this, that this is not just conjecture, is that the day after Chavez died, Venezuela played in the World Baseball Classic in Miami. The Venezuelan government made a request of Major League Baseball to fly their flag, their own flag, at half-mast. Major League Baseball refused. It, is, it does seem to be another parable, and I know this is what you, you've spent your life work, life's work on, actually, in looking at the parallels between sport and the rest of society. And this does seem to be a parable about market forces, oh, and regulation, and the race to the bottom. It, it's, it's, a, it's, about, it's a parable about globalization, certainly. But it's also a parable about the way that Hugo Chavez attempted to challenge some of those power relationships. And what makes sports such a powerful tool in having these discussions is that you hear, of course, right now, a great demonization of Hugo Chavez on the right. And one could argue an overly flowery view of Hugo Chavez on the left. But when you tell like a very basic story about this is what baseball looked like before Hugo Chavez, and this is what he tried to do, it at least provides insight in why millions of people in Venezuela are mourning right now. Dave Zarin, thank you very much. My privilege. And that's it from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AljaZero.net.